Welcome to the Weekly Mag. We come back with a lot of enthusiasm. In today's show, Cinema is the Star. Film directors David Victori and Dennis Rovira are here with their new films. In our new section, First Timers, a foreigner will take part in a human tower for the first time. Don't miss it! And we'll bring our craziest character, Mark Broderick and Matthew Tree together to compare the rituals when going to the cinema. Grab some popcorn, because the Weekly Mag is about to start with Mochella Topor. Hello and welcome back to the Weekly Mag. Louis Lumiere, one of the creators of cinema, predicted that films were an invention with no future. Ironically, more than 100 years after, CGES hosts its International Film Festival. And that's what we're going to talk today uh, and about in the next few minutes. Here you have a glossary that will clarify some of the concepts of our talk. The first concept that will appear during the interview is commercial. A commercial is a paid advertisement or announcement on radio or television. Many filmmakers direct commercials before they can work in the film industry. The second expression you need to know is storytelling. The name says it all, it's the act of telling or writing stories. Now pay attention to this expression, box office. It means the amount of money a film or a play earns from the purchasing of the tickets. Many times the money the films make is directly proportional to the cast. And that leads us to the last word of the glossary, big name. A person who is successful and famous because of their work, a celebrity or a star. And this summer has been especially important in the life of David Victori. He has released his first feature film, El Pacto, The Pact, and he uh, came today to uh, talk to us about his film and many other things. He um, actually made his debut in feature films after ringing the bell with his multi-award winning short film, The Guild, and becoming the world winner of a film festival promoted by YouTube. Well, David Vittori, thank you so much for coming today to the program. Thank you very much. And we also have uh, today with us another young talent, Danis Rovira. Last August, he finished shooting on his first feature, La Influencia, The Influence, which is now in post-production. Danis, welcome to the Weekly Mag. Delighted much, to have you me. here. Well, um, both of you have participated at uh, CGES uh, International Film Festival and I assume you have attended the festival both as uh, directors uh, but also as, uh, as an audience. So tell me how important has CGES been in your careers? Uh, for me it was really, really important. I had the release of my short film The Guild in, in CGES and mm -hmm. it's a huge festival and it's like something really special for everybody that is from Catalonia because it's a really important festival around, around the world. So you can feel like this opportunity to have like your, your projects. It was uh, The Guild and also like I released there like Zero, the other short film that I did after The Guild. And it's a really impressive opportunity like have this amazing festival and at the same time have your family and friends that they can come and enjoy the festival and enjoy the premiere so it's pretty like something really special for, mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. And Denise? Well for me it's kind of a first of all like a, like a sick obsession with the festival because I've been like there for uh, many many years like uh, audience. I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, general like fantastic film in general and I, I, I've been shooting like five short films, three of them They've been uh, in the official section, you know, competing there. And I have friends there. I'm, I'm like, uh, I have this cold sweat every time, you know, it comes <laughs> October and I, I need to just watch all the program and try to, you know, see two, three, four films a day. So it's like crazy. And obviously, I mean, having this at home, it's, it's very important for us. I mean, it's not like any other festival mm -hmm. in the world. I mean, this is the probably the best and most important film festival in, in terms of fantastic. horror, fantastic, yes, uh, horror. suspense, whatever it, it's called, like fantastic or yeah. general. And I guess you also have the opportunity to practice your English. By the way, your English is great. Where have you learned it? <laughs> I, I moved to LA like without no, knowing how to speak English and it was terrible because at the beginning, the first meetings that I had there was really kind of really like awkward. 
and I, you know, I need it, so I kind of learned to. it. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah no, I'm, for me, it's also like I've been studying English. I was in LA, in UCLA for a while, studying there, doing some courses here and there, and then I'm, I'm, I'm working like uh, uh, every day, let's say, in English. Uh, I shoot commercials also, like yes. around, and uh, it's my, my working uh, language also. So um, let's talk about uh, your, your films. I want to talk about The Pact, uh, David. It, uh, uh, the plot um, is a little bit um, about this really traumatic family um, experience. So tell me how much uh, you, um, you were inspired by your own experience to make this film. Yeah, the origin of the idea of the, the movie is really like special and personal because after a terrible situation, a terrible uh, death in my family, one of my sisters passed away uh, eight years ago. My father suddenly, after weeks of, uh, of that, my, my father was like, I cannot sleep. I'm like having like this nightmare, but it's the same nightmare every day. Which was? So at the, at the moment, I didn't, I didn't ask him what it was about. I just say, okay, maybe you can write it write it down and maybe that can be something to just like release this story. And he was like, okay, I, I will do it. So he did it. And after weeks, he was like, I want to read it to you. I want to read it to you and see what do you think about that? Because it seems like a story, it seems like a movie. And mm. it was like, for me, I was a little bit scary because I was like, okay, I'm, my father is a musician. So he never... A magician? No, a mu musician. A musician. Yeah, yes. he, he played piano <laughs> okay. for a long time. And so he didn't have any relationship with writing or storytelling. But he read the story and I was like in shock because I, I was feeling like, wow, that's kind of like really personal because it's, it was kind of a journey for him. But at the same time, I felt like, okay, I want to turn that like my first movie. So after some years, uh, we are here and this has become my first movie. So mm -hmm. That's quite impressive. Yeah. Just tell us a little bit about this nightmare and the, the, the story. Yeah, so the movie, uh, what it's about is like this mother that uh, suddenly one day uh, her daughter uh, become really ill and the doctors tell her that they don't have any chance to save uh, her life. So in front of that situation, she just suddenly has this uh, opportunity to make this kind of crazy pack with some, de some devil or some like uh, weird force, strange force. So she accepts and suddenly that becomes like kind of a huge nightmare. I see. Wow. Quite impressive. Um, a very tough story. Yeah. Well, um, I want to ask also Denis about his uh, movie, which is not finished yet. It's in um, post-production at the moment, but it's, uh, the coincidence is that uh, it, it's also about uh, family uh, drama. Okay, and in your case, uh, Denis, it's inspired, it's based on a book by Ramsey uh, Campbell, uh, one of the most important uh, writers of the genre. So what made you choose this book, this author, this story? Well, when you, you, you confront the first time, I mean, as a first time director, I think the most important uh, would be, at least for me, to, to find a story that hook you up, you know, like in terms of something personal that happened to you or, 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 or any story that bring you, you know, to that level of confidence. I'm going to you know, tell the story to the audience because it's, it's important, it's necessary, or simply because you want to entertain, you know. I think Ramsey Campbell has, has this uh, high level of uh, horror tales that have um, probably both sides of it, you know. It's very entertaining in terms of, of you know, he's a master of, of, of horror. He's, uh, you know, at the level they say uh, Stephen King, but he's not being produced as much, you know? I mean, you, have, you can find any, in any theater, you know, a Stephen King movie, but suddenly happens that um, for this author, we've, the, we've been the only ones in Spain adapting him. Um, That's good. Balaguero. Yes. He made The Nameless. 
Um, based on his book, uh, the second name has been adapted, by, it's Pact of the Fathers, I think, by uh, Paco Plaza, and then mm -hmm. I realized, you know, why not? I mean, I, I, I love this film, especially The Nameless is one of the, my favorite films that I've seen, you know, and, and it, it was really impactful for me, mm -hmm. and I read the book. I thought it's a book from 90, uh, 89. I think it has a lot of elements, and we just wanted to give another vision of it, more modern, let's say, adapted to the to Spanish reality, adapted to Spanish characters. And that's what we have uh, based on a, you know, a very good story. You know, we have a, a modern horror film. Well, as you can see, uh, cinema has uh, something special that appeals to those who work all those who work in it. And it's not surprising that some people think it is worth dedicating a museum to it. And there are even people who consider it an important part of their home. This is the case of our guest. His name is David Karaben, the soul of the band Mishima, in the Home from Home section. Check it out. Hi. My name is David Caraben and I am at the Museum of Cinema. My first approach to culture in general was through uh, uh, watching classic, classic movies and, and films. That was my, my, my first connection with music, my first connection with literature, with, uh, with, pain, with, um, with painting, uh, with, with everything. I think it's, it's, it's uh, the biggest uh, form of art uh, for the 20th century that started with, um, with, the, with the big inventions. And cinema was one of them. And uh, cinema uh, uh, was a mixture of... Uh, and, 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 the, um, and the connection between lots of uh, arts that preceded it, like uh, theater, literature, music, um, uh, circus. <laughs> It's a great thing that uh, here in Girona you have a, 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 a film museum, a cinema museum. Forms of art that we, that we feel, we, we, we know that are still alive, already have some institution to uh, preserve their successes and their, uh, their best expressions. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very nice way to, um, to start knowing uh, what, what this, what this uh, form of art has given to us and, and um, is capable of, of still giving. With a new paradigm, uh, the end of analog culture and, and the beginning of the, the digital era, there's more music and there's more cinema, as, as I understand it, than ever, but there's less uh, classical movies or there's, there's less classical bands in, uh, in rock music. Everybody has, uh, has gained accessibility to, to the, the means of production, but uh, the level uh, of, the, of, of their texts, uh, the, the level of their um, narratives, have, has downgraded a little bit also. So, so um, there's more cinema, and there's cinema even in, in, in media that are not uh, strictly cinema. Uh, I mean, there's cinema in, uh, in, a, in a post, for instance, in a, in a story in Instagram. Uh, uh, there's, there's, uh, there's film cut there. There's a, there's a way of, of um, capturing reality that has to do a lot with film culture. But perhaps it's not uh, nowadays only uh, in, in the cinema theaters. It's, it's, it's spread all around. They don't know it. We don't know it. In a few minutes, our guests will be answering our mystery questions. And here we are again. Today, the main issue of the show is cinema. And we are accompanied by two young filmmakers, David Victori and Denis Rovira. And I would also like to introduce you to our new collaborator. He's a man with a passion for cinema, football and music and his name is Oriol Rodriguez. Oriol, thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's great to have you here. It's my pleasure. Well, uh, these two guys, uh, Denis and uh, David, uh, make uh, horror films, as yeah. you know, and um, they also use lots of elements um, of horror to build their own stories. In your person, what's your personal taste? Do you like watching yeah, of horror course. films? I, I really do. I, I mean, I think that all film lovers uh, love uh, 
terror films. Uh, and I think it's a, an, an open, a big school for, for the filmmakers. I mean, a lot of filmmakers have In started the their careers yeah. Yeah, with, mm -hmm. with horror movies. So I, I, I really love it. So uh, I know you've got uh, some data prepared for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the fact is, I, 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 I love uh, horror movies, but a lot of people love horror movies. I mean, it's impossible not to love uh, horror movies. Mm -hmm. And I've been, I've been analyzed the, the box office by, by genre. I, I only have been able to find the data referring to the United States and Canada. Mm -hmm. And do you want to know what place uh, yeah, occupies? Sure. Uh, we do. Please. I think movies? we are in a so, yes, yes, nice moment of, you know, <laughs> for what horror you films. Guess, yeah. what, what place do you guess that? I think, I mean, The Nun, It, and all these films are just blowing up the box yeah, office. Exactly. I think we are in a big, great moment of, you know, horror film. It's a big area. Yeah, R referring to the box office, uh, the number one uh, are action movies. I think... Superhero yeah, movies. Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah, superhero movies. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have a box office about 3,300 million. Wow. But horror okay. movies are the number four. They're cheaper. Number four. Number four. So, it's so with uh, <laughs> when 1,000 million dollars. Uh, but what surprised me most to me is that comedies are the, the number six. I don't know why. I suppose that they have a bigger uh, box office. And that really surprised me. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know if we are a little bit uh, sadomasochistic or... <laughs> or, uh, or comedies are not that... Uh, in Spain, that right? Right. Or, yeah. yes. in, in Spain this year is different, no? Because in Spain it seems that you it's think comedy. I, I, it's comedy I the first one. one. I have no. only find the, the, yeah. the data for United States. The results, and, yeah, for the yeah. US. I, think I guess yeah. in Spain. What is also comedy. interesting that years ago, I mean, rating a film R, like above 18, R. was like, oh my God, you know, we're going to lose a lot of audience and be careful with that now from it halloween is coming in you know in yes two yeah. three months whatever mandy mandy is a crazy film you see it in sieges with nicolas cage performing like a gory absolutely madness a lot of blood a lot of violence i don't know why people are liking that more i don't know it like seems the tendency is like yeah we're gonna go to see that film because it's pure horror and of course, you can see, you know, many type of genre, but when, when it's horror, like strong and violent, now it's probably people are reacting better. I don't know why. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, in the 80s, uh, when you think about horror movies, you think about something like a B-series. B-series, yeah. Yeah, something like Bad yes. Taste, okay, yeah, okay. but you have uh, some good films, but. Then we, now we have uh, filmmakers like Guillermo del Toro mm. and big names doing things that, that are not uh, more sophisticated horror movies, but Absolutely. you have some, some elements of the... Absolutely. And of course we've got uh, David and uh, Denise. Mm? <laughs> uh, tell me, I would like to know uh, to what extent would you call your films horror movies or maybe you would call them more like uh, psychological uh, thrillers with some horror elements or suspense? Uh, I think that for, for my case is like we, we call it uh, like a th um, psychological horror thriller. Okay. It's kind of a really mix of genres uh, and we feel, um, we feel that that is accurate for our film because it's like this kind of, uh, the course of the story is like this like um, fam uh, family dra drama Yes. But it's like with these two different like uh, ways to explain the story that mm -hmm. we are using elements for uh, from the horror, but at the same time is a thriller. All the yes. movies are thriller. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is accurate for, for us, for the pact. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like David was saying, I mean, uh, there's a lot of subgenres in, you know, in the genre. <laughs> I mean, we call it genre, but there's a lot of genres like comedy, drama. And for, I don't know the reason, I mean, all this englobes, you know, like different subgenres inside the horror yes. uh, mm -hmm. world. And I think uh, in my case, uh, I just, I was interested in telling a story about a, also a family, but exploring the depth of these dark, uh, twisted um, situations yes. what can lead you to more of the 
horror, pure horror situations, you know, like pushing the limits a little bit more. Yes, like you, you guys were saying before, um, there's a big audience uh, here for this kind of uh, cinema. So uh, I'd like to ask you if you think it is more and more difficult to scare people, you know, because if it's a good question. It's a, <laughs> it's a very good question. I'm, I mean, you know, asking myself in exactly. the editing how I'm going to scare the you people. You must think I'm uh, really like really hard to, to uh, about techniques, really well developed techniques to, know, to make people be I'm, afraid to be to absolutely. scare. Absolutely. I mean, you know? go to see the to nun, for example. You see, you know, every five eight minutes a, a scare. No, exactly. where is going to come from? I'm not that interested in my case in that situation of you know these type of films. I mean. Uh, I want to tell a story and, and hook the people from, you know, the feelings, a uh, really dramatic story that, you know, leads to a I horror. See. And there's mm -hmm. some scare jumps and whatever, but, but I mean, it's more psychological. It's very complex okay. to talk about. It's very difficult to scare people out. So I don't think you have to pretend to scare the people. I think it's just telling a story and... If it, if and how you tell it, of course. If it's, it's delicate and it talks about the family and someone, you, you, you can scare them out a lot, like talking about very close relationships inside the family, for example. So my film talks about that. That's the influence. I see. The weight of the family members in of all of us. You know, it's kind of a possession or, or influenced. You know. Yeah, the, you the, agree. our case is similar because yes. in, a, in, a, in a way, how we use horror, it was like more like going through the character, through the yes. main character, who is going through this dramatic exactly. and horror situation where it's like losing somebody that you really love is a horror situation. Like what that happened to you in a Absolutely. real life, you go through a nightmare. So we use that elements more like uh, go through her experience more than like just uh, a, a way to play with the out with the audience. It was more like trying to bring the audience close to the feeling of what's going on with her. Yes, right? which yeah. is very difficult, yeah. I think, in my opinion. I mean, one of the scariest uh, films I, I, I've ever seen, I think, um, was um, Blair Witch Project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, I mean, it was, the idea was very simple, but the result, it was pretty amazing. Yeah, because it, it, it played, I mean, very well, let, like uh, starting as a false documentary like and, a real story. And, and you don't see anything. It's just off camera, everything. It's very scary. I don't know. I mean, there's different, you know, ways of scaring the audience. But I mean, definitely uh, you can think that scary jumps are the easiest ones. I are not <laughs> to do like a good scary jump nowadays because you've seen everything is not easy. Mm -hmm. Not at all. It's not at all. I mean, uh, and I think in my case, I feel more comfortable with telling a story psychological and, and having the monster at home. Yes. It's like real, you know, you, you deal with it every day. That's the sort of story. Well, I'm experience. talking about uh, film festivals and cinema. I suppose you guys had the opportunity to participate in many film festivals. So I'd like to ask you, um, uh, who was the most exciting person you met uh, in these places? Uh, directors, actors? I mean, in my case, I think that is uh, obviously, no, but I met like Michael Fassbender in the festival when I won yes. mm -hmm. with my short film and then he became one of the producers of my next project. So we kind of wow. <laughs> had this relationship and had these meetings in, in Los Angeles and, and of course for me it was a huge opportunity. With really Scott was different, he was involved also in the project, but I Unfortunately, I never had the chance to sit with him. He, he watched the, sh the short film and he gave me some, some advices, but just online, not mm. never like in person. Okay. That was uh, a shame, but, but obviously really Scott is pretty busy. How you can see about his filmography that is shooting like a huge movie almost every, every year. Excellent. And you? David, well, um, I'm about Dennis. to start my experience with a feature film. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I'm experiencing like with short films. I really like festivals because you. you but meet I mean, people you met people in um, in festivals and impressed um, you. One of the most fascinating, you know, person I've met, for example, is Angel Sala, He's the director yeah, yeah, of Sitges. Yeah. It's one of the yeah, persons of that you're like, wow. I mean, this man knows a lot of, you know, about film, about movies, and and he's just someone who's there, you know. Yeah. And I really, you know, um, now it's the time to go to a festival. I think for the audience who's watching this 
program, I think it's great to just go and step by. Yeah, and see it's about the level to, of to end. Yeah, films that we are having Spanish. I appreciate films. it. Uh, yeah. What a huge festival we have! It's so amazing. Close. Yes, it's amazing. exactly. It's amazing. Like definitely, it's a must. All over the world are talking about this, and it's just right there at the corner. You know. Well, um, somebody who uh, did um, uh, go to see Jess, and uh, I'm sure she had a great time, is our uh, special um, uh, collaborator Anna Priscilla. Uh, she just um, um, went to to see Jess, and she um, she came up with a video in which she uh, will show us what stars are shining this year on the red carpet of the festival. So let's have a look together, okay? We are in Sitges at the International Fantastic Film Festival of Catalonia. 10 days of cinema, 250 movies. We want to talk to actors, we want to talk to the visitors, we want to talk to the industry. Do you come with me? Here we are with Ernesto Alterio, one of the main characters of uh, La Sombra de la Ley, Gun City in English. There's a lot of guns in the movie. Yeah, there's a lot of guns, there's a lot of action, a lot of story, uh, lots of ingredients there. Yeah. You play a pretty peculiar character. Did you enjoy playing this uh, character? Yeah, I had a terrific time doing this character, you know, because he's so violent. for your film, it is important to be in uh, festivals such as Sitges? I think it's a very good thing because it's it's a, a good platform uh, to promote the film and uh, and to meet uh, people and uh, people from, from the industry. Keep enjoying the promotion. Thank you so much. <laughs> If there's someone in Catalonia that knows about cinema, this is Jaume Figueras. Jaume, good evening. Hello. This is the 51st edition of the Sitges Festival. I'm guessing it's not your first time here. Not exactly, because I think my first festival was 48 years ago. What is the importance of a festival uh, such as the Sitges Festival for Catalonia? I think it's the most important film, fantastic film, a fantastic festival in the, in the world, in Europe at least. Most people is going to to see just with pleasure this, this time. We're in an industry gathering and we can see the most important thing, it's food and drink. I'm from the northeast of England. I'm from Austin, Texas. I'm from Ireland, but based in um, Hamburg in Germany. I'm from Montreal, Canada. I'm a producer and we're looking to speak to sales agents, distributors and other filmmakers just about how it's all done here. It's networking with people, getting to see people like Ron Perlman and Gareth Evans. You've got uh, Peter Weir, you've got the writer from The Truman Show, uh, Anthony Eccle, you've got Nicolas Cage, you've got Pam Greer this afternoon. It's, uh, this year is brilliant. It's the best. It's the, I mean, it's the biggest, best genre festival in the world. It's, and it's right in your backyard, you know? It's, uh, I mean, that's why I fly all the way from Texas to come here and stay for a week and, you know, eat amazing food, see, like, everybody in the, in the genre film community. Already met with a few filmmakers here this morning, and so I think, uh, I think there's a very good chance we'll be bringing some very nice Catalan uh, projects to Montreal next year. Here we can see a really long queue, and one of the people in this queue is David. I just had my holidays for, for just this, the, the 10 days of, of the festival, and we, we have a flat here that uh, we use normally to, uh, to come here and see the movies. I've been working the whole year, and I thought that it would be nice just to take a few days off and come here, because it's such a nice weather and nice festival, and I really enjoy my time here. So yes, this year I took holidays just to come. Well, it looks like uh, Anna Priscilla had a good time at CGS. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I would like to ask you, if you could choose, um, who would you like to work with, actor or actress? You first. 
<laughs> it's a good question. question yeah? I think that it, I don't. I don't really love depends this on the question. project. No? Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> always depends on the project. Because, you know. I just I no. I mean, there it's, so many it's names a very different. You can think of. I, my film it was to, supposed to be in English. Like I wanted to do a proper adaptation of this British author shot in Wales. You know, like the real locations, and we started to cast in London. You know, but you realize that with a first time movie, like a horror movie, getting to stars, it's super complicated. Mm -hmm. So we so said, we're gonna, to do, it we're gonna do it in Spanish. Spanish. And we got like big names like Emma Suarez, uh, a Catalan actor, Alain Hernandez, uh, Manuela Bellez, Maggie Cibantos. Excellent cast. Perfect, I'm, I mean, I, I think we did the best decision, to be honest. I mean, uh, we have great actors in Spain. Uh, you, David, you also have great uh, actors yeah, yeah, in your film. Yeah, amazing actors. Belen Rueda is the is the main character, the main actress for for the project, and it's it's absolutely amazing work with her. Yes. she's so it's a big obviously name. it's a big name, but she's so talented and she's so. Um, she the, the first meeting that I had with her it was impressive for me that I I felt like the energy as like a young actress like having a meeting for a first time with a director, like really like some like amateur, mm, right? Mm -hmm. This curiosity, I guess. Yeah, no? exactly. Mm. And that was really impressive for me because she did how many movies she, she worked for a long time and she has this still, yeah. she has this like uh, still a young spirit. Exactly, no? young spirit. Well, and in terms of the way you guys work, uh, with Uriol, we have prepared something for you, and um, I'd like Uriol to tell us a little bit uh, yeah, what it's about. Since we are talking about how you work with actors and actresses, um, yeah, we, we are really interested in how how you work with with all of them. But and the first, relationship between directors and, and mm -hmm. the cast, no? Yeah, but first, well, uh, Stanley Kubrick is one of the greatest, mm -hmm. but uh, everybody know that uh, he was crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right, no? And it's said that uh, during the film of uh, The Shining, uh, he put such a pressure on, on the actress uh, Shelley Duvall that he, that when, when she finished the, the, the film, the, the shooting, uh, she was put in a psychiatric uh, hospital. Really? Yeah, 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 to recover from, from that experience. That it, it was so intense that uh, she needs a, a time for, for, for a rest in the... Mm -hmm. Well, I hope it's not the case with your As far as I know, it's not the case in my actors. project and with <laughs> my actors. <laughs> and then you have uh, Akira Kurosawa that... Uh, uh -huh. Well, his nickname was Teno, that means the, the Emperor, so... It, it, Can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And well, I think we need to finish, but before concluding, I would like to ask you why should we watch your films? Why should we watch The Pact and why should we watch The Influence? <laughs> Mine is not finished. <laughs> A good thing about our movie, I think, is that people that like horror can enjoy it, but people that doesn't like horror can enjoy it too. The movie has this kind of like trying to go deep in meaning and trying to go deep um, with the kind of like the arc of the character, the main mm -hmm, character. Mm -hmm. And the psychology. Exactly, in a way that we are really, we, we, we work so hard to try to explain and try to explore some concepts and ideas that for me are really important about okay. because at the end you know this character that is like trying to go against the death of uh, her daughter yes will learn a lot mm -hmm. in that process and, and and what is more important to learn about that is like about death and life right mm, sounds good and denise in your case well, in my case, the film also explores, you know, like things like death, life, and, and uh, the afterlife. Uh, and, but most of it, I mean, the situation of horror becomes, you know, like gruesome and like, like very terrorizing uh, because of the relationship of the characters. I mean, we're talking about two sisters and a grandma and the little girl, you know, different generations, and they all confront each other. It's very painful to watch, mm -hmm. but it reminds us somehow we all have, you know, at home relationship like mm -hmm. this. It's like know? a it's, timely subject, no? It's like it's like taking to an extreme real situations we all have at home. I mean, yeah. we all are You're influenced right. by someone at home, mm -hmm. um, like relatives. Mm -hmm. 
uh, for good and for bad. Before we go, because we need to finish, I'm going to ask you one of those unexpected questions, which is, what do you know about Zimbabwe? Oh, wow. My God. <laughs> Tarzan was there, right? <laughs> Oh, well, um, this question does make sense because in this uh, second season of the Weekly Mag, we invite you to make a tour around the world in a new section called eSpeakers. We will uh, get to know a little about countries where English is an official language and we'll do it thanks to expats who are now living here in Catalonia. We will discover the diversity of countries, people and points of view behind English speakers and today we will get to know Zimbabwe with Tina Masawi. Hi, my name is Tina Masawi. Uh, I am 27 years old. I'm from Zimbabwe and I am a singer here in Barcelona in two groups, Tina and Joe, that's formed by myself and Jose Azul. And we're also in the Teasers Blues Band, which is a huge blues band that performs frequently around Barcelona and in festivals around Spain. <laughs> I would describe it as an, an unknown little place, uh, but very beautiful, full of amazing people. Great for nature lovers, people that love nature and natural beauty, I guess. Well, it's very green half of the year and a little bit dry. We have the savanna, which is like brown, tall grass. And there's some mountains and of course, it is actually in the top 2% of the world's comfort zones. We have our own little microclimate, so the temperature, the weather is amazing all year round. Definitely I would recommend the Victoria Falls because that is one of the seven wonders of the world. It's amazing, amazing. I mean, there's no words for it. Uh, I would say uh, Joshua Nkomo, he was the Vice President of Zimbabwe until 1999 and he fought in our liberation struggle, helped and played a huge role in gaining us independence. Um, he was nicknamed the father of the nation and so you can understand that he was a well-loved and incredible figure. We eat a lot of uh, beef because we're kind of, we're a farming country, so we have a lot of happy cows, uh, grass-fed cows. So the beef meals are very great. And our staple food is uh, something called sadza, and that is made with maize flour. And we usually eat that with kale and other green leafy vegetables and some nice beef. I think we laugh at everything, to be honest. I, just the Shona language, I speak Shona, and um, anything you can say really can literally be funny. So the people are always laughing when you go there, people are smiling because there is just so much humor that is in the language itself. Well, we like, in general, we are people that like to gather around and um, celebrate anything together and there's a lot of music always um, and yeah I just I, I miss a lot <laughs> these events because there's a lot of local music and it, it's just beautiful it's, it's basically very uh, spontaneous you know we can be anything and people bring out some music and um, yeah that's that's what I miss the most it's anywhere you go it's it can be a festivity at any time <laughs> Thank you, Tina Masawi. What a beautiful country, Zimbabwe. I think this section will make us travel, you'll see. Well, we are getting near the end of the interview and in this new season, we have thought of ending it with a mysterious question. We're going to offer our guests, Denise and David, a container full of balls and it will be them who will choose the final question. To carry out this uh, ritual, we count on our collaborator, 
Mark Broderick. Hello. Hello. <laughs> and I have my basket full of balls. Excellent. <laughs> wow, let's see. Well, I feel let's a proceed. little bit like uh, Ronaldo, known one of these uh, choosing things. Right. Good for <laughs> you. Who wants to go first? Please. Okay. Put your hand in good and deep. The last one. There we go. Oh, fuck. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay, don't worry. Hold the question for a okay. second, right? All there right. you, sir. Let's Get go. in there at the bottom. Good stuff. Okay. Okay. Mark, please have a seat. Join nice. us. All right, so who goes first? Okay. Ready for the challenge. You, if you have only 60 seconds to leave your home, what will you take with you? Mm. Wow. Tricky one. In fact, I'm ready for that. And I have like a box with all of my pictures on it. <laughs> so I will take the box. Fake no passports, way. money, huh? fake passports, money, guns. Uh, no, <laughs> just the pictures. No? Just pictures. Yeah, pictures that the, the, not the digital pictures, of course, the digital pictures I have in my computer, but the pictures that I have from, you know, when I was a kid. Good point. Okay, excellent. So I see you, well, we couldn't surprise you too much with this question. Let's see, <laughs> Denise. He was prepared. He was prepared. Yeah. He already knew. No, You've seen inside my bag of balls, didn't you? <laughs> I think it's the same question. <laughs> what is the most expensive thing that you have ever stolen? Wow. <laughs> the moment of truth. Uh, the thing it applies to me. You know, I'm, I'm a good guy. You know, the most probably. I mean, I I've won't stolen. Tell anyone, no? uh, so you stole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm, you know, philosophically talking. <laughs> Oof. No, it's just that I was, a, a, I was telling Mark, I won't mind. tell anyone. The Memories the or, 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 or moments from people, or maybe I'm, I'm stolen uh, part of a life of somebody that, uh, you know, she's living with me and, you know, probably it's, it's part of the life. You, 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 can, you can say it's, it's something that probably it's positive or not. I mean, you know, time will say, but... Um, Physically stolen, I haven't been able to stole anything like. You haven't expensive. been able. You haven't had the chance. You haven't, but you're you haven't been able. I, I, I'll yeah. Probably, I, I could. I don't know. I mean, I don't ha I've been, I haven't been in the situation. You're yet. worried about your visa situation, not to get back <laughs> in. Exactly. The US. If you admit it here, there's no way Trump sent you back in. <laughs> but I really love what he said because one, one really beautiful thing about like thinking about movies and making movies is like think that audience is like giving you like part of his life, like two hours of his entire life. And this is like the most beautiful present that people can give it to you as a director. Right? Mm. Absolutely. And with this uh, really beautiful reflection <laughs> of uh, David's, we end uh, this interview. Thank you so much, David and Denise, for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you for participating in this uh, game with us. Thank Thanks. you. Mm? Pleasure. And Mark, don't leave, because I'm going to see you in a bit with Matthew. OK. Ready? Good stuff. Yeah. Looking forward Hello to it. Thank you so much. I'll see you, you next time. See you. And it's time to learn some more new vocabulary. As you know, we want you to keep your English properly running. And in each show, three English teachers from the International House Barcelona will talk to you about different concepts related to the day's main topic. And today it's cinema. Let's start with Becca Bardaka from England. Hey guys, today's topic is cinema. A helpful distinction to make when talking about films is that between feature films and short films. Feature films are full length films and usually go past 90 minutes, whereas short films don't go over 35 minutes or so. Another important word to remember is genre. Now the genre refers to the kind or style of the film, for instance, a comedy or a romantic film or a thriller. Each story is the result of actions of different characters. As the characters develop an action, this slowly turns into a plot, which is the main story or the main idea of a movie. The plot is developed and unfolds over several smaller scenes where the action take pla takes place in the same place. Which brings me to my next word, casts. 
The cast refers to the group of actors or actresses who play a role in a movie, whether it's a starring role or whether they're just an extra. Now, these actions that the characters develop aren't their own actions, obviously, but those of the screenwriter, who's responsible for writing the main idea of the movie and all the dialogues and stuff. He writes, or he or she, writes these uh, actions in something called the script, which is a document which keeps together all these actions and the dialogue. Now, of course, a script isn't a movie. For a movie to actually be made, you need a group of really, really talented people and quite a bit of money, in theory, at least. That's all for today, guys. Until next time, bye. The 5321's killer guitars will occupy this stage of the weekly mag. Don't miss them. And throughout the show, we have talked about different topics related to cinema. And now we want you to approach uh, a thorny issue with us, and nothing better than uh, the face of section to do that. And we've got Patricia Scalona. Welcome back. Thank you very much. How are you? I'm very happy to be here again. Yes, you had a good holiday? I had a sort of a sort holiday. Of. <laughs> but yeah, I'm happy. Okay, uh, working, I guess. Yes, a lot. Mm, that's good. Yeah. Well, anyway, Patricia, you have a new opponent uh, this uh, season. I know. Uh, his <laughs> name is Donaka Tiernan. Welcome, Donaka. Correct Donica. this time. I pronounced <laughs> it correctly this time? Excellently. Well, I have to confess, I uh, kind of practiced the whole summer. I'm very flattered. Right. Thank you the very first much. time I didn't get it right, but I tried to get it right from now on. Okay. All right. Good, good, good. <laughs> okay, so Donaka is an Irish name, correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Very Irish. It means something like it's the uh, it's the like the Irish name for it's Donald, for it's example. Not for Donald, no, no. nor Doc. It's uh, the Ir It means <laughs> it means red-headed warrior. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. An you probably title. made that up, but no, I anyway. didn't. I wish I did. It like according if if it was named for me, it should mean I don't know, redheaded layabout, redheaded lazy person, redheaded <laughs> movie watcher. Well, that's a good start. Interesting, interesting mm -hmm. name. Thank and uh, Donica, um, we brought you here today with us. We would like to talk about cinema, and the topic today is uh, what I want to ask you guys is if you prefer a dubbed or a subtitled film. So dubbing or original version. And we start with uh, Patricia's opinion. So I'm going a little bit against my opinion, my own opinion, but I do, I'm, I'm for, in this, for the purpose of this debate, I'm for um, dubbing. Um, because over the years, even though I was very adamant never to see any films that were, um, that were dubbed, dubbed, dubbed uh, and always to watch them, in their original version, I come to understand why, you know, some people go to movies and or watch TV, uh, which is dubbed. Um, one of the main arguments for me is um, the, the people who can't understand the language, or people who are um, handicapped in some way, like blind people, for, for example, or little children or older people, you know, yes. for them, uh, they don't speak any other language but their own. The reasons for that we can go <laughs> into in another debate. But for, for me, that's a very important um, reason to have that Fair enough. Of, yeah, on Fair enough. Well, that's, uh, that seems like a good uh, reason, Donica. What do you have to say? Yeah, yeah it, it's fine. It's a fine reason, but I mean, so we're going to define the way that we re we re receive and appreciate cinema ba uh, based on a, a small group a group of people who, fair enough, might require dubbed movies to fully get the gist of the story. Yeah, if, if somebody's hard of eyesight or something like that. But beyond that, you said uh, you understand the reason why people watch dubbed cinema, and I understand the reason as well. It's because they're lazy. It's because they're lazy and they're embracing this easy option rather than taking in the art at its fullest. I'll tell you, over, I would say, and you're an actress, you might agree, maybe it won't, but well, if you disagree, you're, but you used to be, okay, used fair enough. Be. So, <laughs> this, so this is you playing you right now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's like over 50% of the actor's performance is, is emotions, 
is emotional performance. And basically then, when a dubbed actor steps, a dubbing actor steps in and you know, tries to contribute to, to the movie in their way, probably even through no fault of their own, they reduce the quality of the movie by 33%, I would say at least. It just, hmm. just slams down. I mean, and here's the thing, all movies used to be dubbed. That's, that's a fact. Any, you watch any movie by Federico Fellini, it's dubbed. It's dubbed in Italian because the technology didn't exist. And once the technology existed, it, it came into existence, all movie directors jumped to it and started, if, if they were making movies in one language, one of them in another country, they'd spend a lot of money on good subtitles because they didn't want to lose the actors' performances because it's a big part of the movie. Mm. And you know, I mean, that for me would be one of the most unfortunate things about like, like, like uh, having to watch dub cinema that way because I would realize it. Because even when you watch the movie, it just looks silly. I see what you've done there, you know, appealing to Martella's uh, past, and, uh, you know, in order to get her to be on your side. But well, I'm not buying that was, it. Um, <laughs> that's a good uh, thing, no? It's a good ability. But the, it's a good one, yeah. But the thing that he is forgetting is the fact that there's a whole industry of actors and directors <laughs> who work in, um, who are, just because you're dismissive of it, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And those are I'm not saying it doesn't exist. Well, it's, it exists and they are professionals and they have to be respected. Oh. And theirs is an interpretation of the film mm -hmm. um, that you know, can also be very artistic and can also bring something to the film. It's not, and we're not talking people who just go there in the studio not knowing what they're gonna say. They study their roles, they have directors who are going to you know, direct them in the dubbing, and there's a whole industry behind the dubbing that's very important for us. And that's, a, that's a fact, that's, that's undeniable, but um, uh, is it really necessary? Really necessary, no, but the, the technology right now allows you to watch whatever version you want that's true. at home. That's true. So why not? Why not have, you know, be it because they're lazy, as you say, or be it because they have a problem, or be it because whatever reason they have to watch, uh, or because they're used to it. I don't see what the problem is. Plus, I think, you know, the whole imperialistic view of the English-speaking people who think that, you know, oh, their language cannot be touched. <laughs> well, um, what the situation in uh, Ireland? With is that, uh, well, I would watch plenty of French movies particularly, I watched some Spanish movies, uh, never watched a dubbed movie in my life, except like there's an option that some people take, it's, like, it's known as the dubbed comedy, where uh, this was a phenomenon in the early 60s. Woody Allen's first movie is one, What's Up New Tiger Lily, where uh, they would take like an Asian movie and just dub it in with comical voices because cause that's how ridiculous dubbing looks. Hmm. And to answer your other point, it's like, yeah, they have the option to do that, but I'm sure you could have the option to uh, I'm sure if you had the option to read Crime and Punishment with half the text and the rest of the story filled in with, with pictures, you know, that would be an option. But I don't think many people would take it because, you know, it would be easy enough to see that, oh no, you're literally diluting the art down to its nub. Well, you know, you, you've raised a good point there mm -hmm. with literature. You know, I, for me, um, what I was saying before about, about interpretation, mm -hmm. it's the same as not reading translated books. Because, you know, you're, you're just reading an interpretation of the translator. It's impossible to be completely loyal to whatever the writer was trying to say. I'd agree. When, and that happens with the films as well. So the argument could be raised that, you know, if, if you're so um, against dubbing, you should be against translation but not in near, books as well. Not near so, not near so much to the, to the level of uh, dubbing. For, because the, the fact of the matter is... I think it refers is, more to the, um, to the quality of the, the film in general, no? And also the way yeah. that it's, it, it might be disrespectful of the director's and actor's art. Well, it, it definitely is. It's disrespectful of the, uh, an entire audience as well. Particularly now, I'm s sorry for saying this, in this blessed country where I live and I love living here, but the dubbing that they do here in Spain comes across as sexist so much. It, sexist? It boggles the mind. Why every, is it sexist? Because every man sounds like a young Antonio Banderas trying to seduce you. <laughs> uh, every woman sounds the same and every child sounds the same as the women. It's, cr it's crazy.
to just listen to it from an outsider coming in. Every single, every, every single child sounds like la 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 da 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 da. Like they've got okay. no individualized characteristics to them. You just, you, that's one of the things that that completely well, bowls me that's over. That's Danica's uh, opinion, but um, I do agree uh, with you, Danica, that it's uh, well. I do prefer hearing the the actor's original voice. I think um, yeah, uh, that's a, uh, really that's a plus, and it's. Um, you lose a lot by um, by not actually by by hearing a substitute in in another language. That's the first. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's the first time you're not agreeing with me. I'm not taking this well. <laughs> well, it's it's a, it's a bit difficult today because um, you know I'm um, in a favor of uh, original uh, uh, version. But anyway, I think your arguments are are really good, and it's it's true that there are some situations like the ones you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, children and uh, disabled people and so on, where you can't really um, <coughs> um, argue that that's a, a different, com a completely different situation. Well, and um, today has been uh, difficult because usually I agree with uh, Patricia, <laughs> and um, being a judge, you know, you have to take uh, difficult decisions today. Uh, I'm with uh, Donica. <laughs> And also, I have to say, I really like your T-shirt. Thank you very much. Oh. I've had this one years. Yeah, yeah. If you want some popcorn, help yourself. Anyway, I'll see you. I'll see you both next week, okay, or next time. Uh -huh. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Take care. <laughs> Thank you, Marcelo. Well, and after so much intensity, let's have a short break. We'll be back in a few minutes. And meanwhile, we leave you with a quote from a Polish-American film producer, Samuel Goldwyn, also known as Samuel Goldfish. Here it is. Mm -hmm. 